From the Cairo Radio Newsroom in Seattle, I'm Dave Ross, and these are the Ross Files. Jeffrey Robinson runs the ACLU Trone Center for Justice and Equality, and for a long time you've been giving speeches about the way that uh, racism and racial history is taught in this country, uh, or basically not taught, I think you'd probably say, right? Is there any places that's doing it correctly? There are places around the country that are doing it uh, much better than other places. Uh, I know that in uh, Bainbridge Island, for example, their history program deals much more with what I would call the hidden history of America. And so there are places in every state in the country where there are breakthroughs in this teaching. Um, But what most people, I think, don't realize is the vast, vast majority of textbooks in America are created in three states, Texas, California, and Florida. And so getting to the editors of those textbooks to ask questions about why isn't this history being taught and why is it so difficult to have this kind of history added to what we are teaching our children about how our country was formed and what was the basis of Mm -hmm. our country. Well, we all know about slavery, but give me some examples of, of things that are big things that are left out. Well, every colony that joined the United States that signed on to the Constitution had a convention. And they talked to each other about the issues that were important. They didn't have telephones or the Internet, so they wrote stuff down. Throughout human history, whenever human beings think they're doing something important, they write stuff down. And that goes back to the cave dwellers before there was written language. One of the things that Patrick Henry, most folks will remember him, give me liberty or give me death. One of the things he said is, there are 236,000 blacks in Virginia and very few in the northern states. What if these folks don't want to stay slaves anymore? If they revolt, we're in trouble because under this new constitution, only Congress can arm the militia. James Madison came right back and said, no, 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 don't worry about that. Um, there's no power to emancipate slaves. You're going to be able to keep them. The Constitution doesn't say anything about that. Because Patrick Henry had also said, what happens if we have to go to war as a country, America? And what if the slaves fight in the army? Is that going to make them free? James Madison saying, no, 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 don't (laughs) worry about it. So they were worried about the Second Amendment being used to emancipate the slaves? What they were worried about is, what Patrick Henry said is, we have 236,000 enslaved people in Virginia. If they decide to revolt, the country is not invaded. And under the new Constitution, only Congress can arm the militia. So if we have to go to Congress to arm our slave patrols, we're in trouble. Now, you will have historians arguing either side of the issue saying— So the, that's the idea, to make sure everybody could have a gun. Exactly. And, and so historians will say— To defend against say, the possibility of a slave uprising. And, and some historians will say, no, there's other provisions in the Constitution. There's this, there's that. My point is this. If you want to know what Americans were concerned about, you can go and read it because they wrote it down. So you think the Second Amendment is a racist amendment? No. I'm saying that whether the Second Amendment was written so that the South could arm its slave patrols, I'm Uh saying that's not even an interesting question (laughs) because I don't care whether that was the purpose or not. And there are historical arguments going both ways. What I'm saying is if you want to know what Americans were concerned about, go read about it because they wrote it down. That's one of the things they were concerned about. When most people in America hear the words affirmative action, they think of programs of uplift in the 60s and 70s uh, where black people were given advantages and then the Supreme Court said that that was kind of reverse racism and that was kind of those programs. The three-fifths clause in the Constitution, counting black people as three-fifths of a human being, Can you tell me what is a greater form of affirmative action than giving one group of people the right to (laughs) own another group of people? But it didn't stop there. Everybody in America has heard of the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Very few people have heard of the Compensated Emancipation Act that occurred in the exact same year, 1862. Were they repaid the slave owners? Slave owners were paid $1 million in 1862 money, which is more, the number today is astronomical. $1 million in 1862 money for quote unquote lost property. Because it was considered a taking? So when you talk about reparations yeah. for slavery, as we have that debate with H.R. 40 going in Congress right now and people signing on to that bill, as we have that debate in America, let's just understand that reparations for slavery have already been paid. They were just paid to slave owners. To the owners. So there's a number attached to that, though. No, and that's, I, think, I think the interesting thing about reparations is that what H.R. 40 does is says, we're going to establish a commission to study the question yeah. and come up with recommendations. The exact same method by which we paid $1.6 billion to Japanese Americans for three years of internment during World War II, $20,000 to each Japanese American that was interned. And that didn't come close to compensating the Japanese Americans for what was done to them. But that shows that we had the national will to pay $1.6 billion to them. All I'm saying is, as we have this debate, don't tell me that it's not possible, because it is. And don't tell me that it would cost too much. Because we have already shown two times in our history that our country is willing to spend a huge amount of money to right a wrong. And so the whole debate about reparations, I think, has been turned on its head because most people who oppose reparations, what do they want to talk about? The problems with the solutions. Yeah. You can't just give people money. Right. This won't happen. That won't work. How are you going to figure this out? How are you going to figure that out? Since when have you known any rational person to approach a problem by talking about the solutions first before you define the problem? And we don't have a common understanding. When you say everyone knows about slavery, but, but we you, don't have a common understanding. You, you use that, your you know, wisdom America. to help me understand, though, how you will come up with a system that the entire country will agree to when they have not been taught some of these aspects of of our history. Well, that, you yeah. just put your finger on the key. You can't talk about the solutions until you define the problem. And that's what H.R. 40 does. It doesn't say come up with a, a number to give out to people. It says define the problem. Yeah. And that's what people don't want to have a debate about. That's where people don't want to have a discussion. Because if we have that discussion, the history of America is written down in black and white. It is undeniable because the people that formed this country didn't have a political correctness screen when it came to white supremacy because everybody was a white supremacist, white people who were in America at the time. So they said exactly what they thought and exactly what they meant. And when we start going through that history, to understand how not just the culture in America, but the law, state, local, and federal, implemented concepts of white supremacy. Now we have a common understanding of our hidden history. And once we have that understanding, we can start talking about solutions. And let me just say, there are all kinds of proposals for reparations solutions. I think they are premature until the problem is really clearly defined. But let's be clear. You can do reparations in America for the descendants of African enslaved people without putting a penny in anybody's hand. How? Education, home ownership, all kinds of ways where the government can simply invest in giving people a frickin' opportunity. Mm -hmm. Fifteen years after the Civil War ended, in 1880, whites owned $36 for every dollar owned by African Americans. Within a couple of years, it was down to 26 to 1, and then 23 to 1. And by 1910, it was down to 16 to 1. 
And in the next 109 years until today, it's now down to about 13 to 1. Now, why is that? Either black people are just not intelligent enough to work hard in a business, to earn money, to save that money, to pass it to the next generation so their children can be better. Either we're just not capable of that or something else is going on. And so if we want to look at the direct and deliberate policies of the United States government, state governments, and local governments, and how they have entrenched a concept like white supremacy. And I know that that is such a loaded term, but that's part of what our history shows. It is what it is. We have printed the legend of American history as opposed to the fact of American history. And here is perhaps the most stark example that I can give you. Several years ago, Politicians in Texas tried to uh, convince the Texas education system that they should be teaching that slavery was a side issue to the Civil War. Were you taught that there was more than one issue that caused the Civil War, that it was something no, other than slavery? I was slavery. taught it was slavery. But then, then I lived in the South for four and a half years, lived in Atlanta. And there it was the War of Northern Aggression, and it was about states' rights. That's right. And so— Texas politicians are saying, teach that slavery is a side issue to the Civil War. Once again, when people think they're doing something important, they write stuff down. Every state that left the Union had a secession convention, and they wrote as clearly as they possibly could why they were leaving the Union. This is not an exact quote, but within a few words, it is an exact quote of what Texas said. All white men are and ought to have equal civil and political rights. That the enslavement of the African race is mutually beneficial to both bond and free and is eminently justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the almighty creator. Are any of those documents taught in school? That's that's what is horrifying, Dave. Virtually none of this is taught in school because as I have gone around the country over the last seven or eight years and I ask people, raise your hands if you have ever heard this. And the frightening thing is the more educated my audience, the less they know. When I speak to Ph.D. level audiences, lawyers, judges, uh, prosecutors and defense lawyers, uh, uh, executives and police departments, they don't know this history. And I didn't know this history hmm. until I was in my. 50s. Well, I certainly wasn't taught. We we never read those documents in school, and the only time, the only reason I know about them is because when this whole uh, you know removal of Confederate statues thing came out, and they were saying, well, these are just parts of history. I went back and looked them up. They're now available online quite easily. And Dave, that's that is what you just said is so important. Our history is hidden, but it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah. And just because you got curious and went to look for something. That is the beauty and the evil of the Internet today. There's all kinds of stuff on the Internet that you have to be very careful of. But you can go to the original source documents and find out exactly what people wrote. When you ask people, have you ever heard the third verse of the national anthem? And do you know what it celebrates? And when I heard the words sung to me, I was horrified. It celebrates the murder of enslaved people because what people don't know is that three weeks before Francis Scott Key saw the bombing of Fort McHenry, he was in Washington, D.C., watching a group called the Colonial Marines who were escaped enslaved black men that fought with the British during the War of 1812. And the Colonial Marines and the British drove the Americans back into Washington, D.C. and set the White House on fire. Three weeks later, he's in Baltimore Harbor watching the bombing of Fort McHenry, and he writes the poem that becomes the national anthem. And the end of the third verse says, No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight and the gloom of the grave, and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the That was not just metaphorical. No, he was saying to those enslaved people, We will, no refuge could save you from the terror of flight. We will hunt you down and the gloom of the grave. 
We will put you in the dirt if you dare fight for your freedom. That's why we don't sing that one. Well, and, and it's interesting. People say, well, we don't sing that one. I'm sorry. That's the third verse of our national anthem. And so it makes an interesting debate when people are saying, how dare you not, quote, unquote, respect our national anthem, when people don't even know what the national anthem contains and anything about the man who wrote it. Because Francis Scott Key was a villiant white supremacist, and he made no bones about it. He was proud of it. So um, this was under the radar for a long time, but now the Internet has brought it out. I mean, white supremacy and white nationalism and white separatism are are all front and center of the, the current debate. So how do you think this should be addressed? I mean, social media... In, with varying degrees, has tried to suppress it. I don't know if that's going to work. They just, you know, migrate to to other platforms. Do you ever get into uh, debates or you know sit on panels with uh, with uh, people like this and try to persuade them? Or the presentation that I am making is going to be made into a documentary film called "Who We Are: A Chronicle of Racism in America." This is what you're talking about at Town Hall this yes. week. Yeah. It's called A Chronicle of Racism, not The Chronicle, because it focuses on the experience of black Americans. And black Americans aren't the only ones to experience racism in America. But that's what this part of the Chronicle focuses on. How do you handle these issues and how do you handle what is clearly a rise in And when I say a rise in white nationalist or white supremacist behavior, I think it's much more visible now. I think folks have always been there, yeah. and they've just been in the shadows. Um, but I think that, uh, for me, part of this is asking Americans to take a good look in the mirror at what we've become and to look at these kind of theories and these kind of philosophies and just ask ourselves, is this who we want to be? Because we can go back into our history and see how this philosophy has infected decisions both small and large up until today. And it's only by confronting that history and looking in the mirror that you can then begin to start the process to change. You don't know if you need a shave until you look in the mirror and see that there's scraggly hair all over your face. And America needs what I am calling a naked lunch moment with race in America. And if you will remember, William Burroughs wrote that book, Naked Lunch, one of the most disturbing books that was ever written. And when he was asked, what does the title mean, Naked Lunch? He said, it's that moment when everyone has to look at what is really on the end of their fork. And that's the moment we need in America to look at what is really on the end of our fork when it comes to racial justice. And I think that for many, many Americans... What they see is not going to be appetizing, but that's what it takes in order to get people to start to think about things differently and to do things differently. Well, I can guarantee that most of the the white people listening would bristle at the idea that they have any connection whatsoever to, to white supremacy or white nationalism. But um, I wanted to bring up a story that you tell about what happened in a checkout line at a supermarket because when I, when I heard that um, – I'm not sure as a white person, unless I was related to the, the person, as in your story, uh, I would have said anything. But but tell that story because I think it's and, – And I will. And I want to say uh, I understand I, I am not accusing any Americans of being white supremacist. What I am saying is uh, there is a definition of white supremacy. White people are better than people of color, period. End of story. It's a very simple definition. What gets complicated is when the things that we do and the policies that we support have that as a premise, and it's recognizing that premise. There was a college professor who was in line at a store like a Whole Foods, and the white woman in front of her was being checked out by a young checker, a blonde woman, maybe in her early 20s, freckle-faced, you know, very fresh-faced, very friendly. And she's chatting with the white woman back and forth, and they're having a great conversation, and the white woman pays for her food and then steps aside. Now, this black woman and her black daughter come up. What the checker didn't know is that these two women are related. 
because there are many interracial families in America, and some sides of the family look very white, and other sides of the family look very African-American. Yeah. These two women are actually related to each other, and they were at the store together. And what the black woman says is that when she approached the counter, she noticed immediately no conversation, no chat about, like, the day or anything like that. They're just going through the checkout. And the woman is a little gruff uh, with her, is that all you have? Do you have another bag? What's over there? And she says that her 10-year-old daughter is starting to notice and kind of looking and going like, Mommy, what is this? And as they get to the end of the groceries that are checked out, uh, the woman pulls out her check to write a check for the groceries, just like her sister did, her Mm -hmm. sister-in-law did. And uh, the woman behind the counter says, "Uh, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. And the 10-year-old now, who has seen all of this interaction, is just saying, why is it different with us when for that woman over there who loves us and who is in our family, it was different for her. And the woman being checked out says, you know, some days you just got to pick your battles. And so it's like, okay. And she gives her the two pieces of ID. Then the woman behind the counter pulls out the bad check book and starts searching through to see if her check and her license are associated with a bad check. And at this point, the 10-year-old is in tears. Mommy, why is she doing this to us? Why why aren't you saying something? This woman is trying to figure out what can I do because right behind her were two older uh, white women. And she says, I'm just calculating like the drama. And if I say something, now I become the angry black woman. And confirming their story. Right. And what do I do? And so I'm standing there humiliated, my daughter in tears. And she says, and our relative, the white woman, she stepped in. And she said, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the unchecker said, oh, what do you mean? Why are you putting her through all this? Why are you asking for ID? Why are you looking at the bad checkbook? Oh, well, that's our policy. No, it's not, because you didn't do that with me, and I wrote a check. And the young woman says, oh, well, I know you. And she says, no, you don't. I've only been here for three weeks. This woman has been coming here for four years. At that point, the two older white women behind the black woman and her daughter step in, and they say, this is ridiculous. What are you doing to this woman? Why are you doing this? And then the store manager comes over and says, is there a problem? And all of the women say, yes, there is a problem. And so, you know, the young girl wasn't fired, but this was a learning experience. And what this black woman and her young child went through You know, you've heard of terms like microaggressions, and people think, hey, everybody has it tough. I don't think many white people walk through the world having that kind of an experience and having the deep humiliation of looking at your 10-year-old daughter and not knowing what to say to her about why this is happening, about why you didn't speak out. But what the end of this story was interesting Uh, When the black woman says, so there are many white people who will say, you know, I am not a racist. I am not a bigot. I don't enjoy any of this stuff that's going on. But what can I do? And there are obviously large things. You can vote. You can inform yourself. You can learn our history and make sure that the kids in your neighborhood, in your in your life, in your school system, are being taught the appropriate history. But you can also step into situations like that. And what the black woman said is that my relative knew that she walked through the world differently. And she used her white privilege to intervene in a situation so that the other people around who were virtually all white did not come to this as, here's a black woman complaining about something. It's, Mm -hmm. hey, what are these women concerned about? What are all of these women concerned about? And how that made such a difference both in her, her experience and her daughter's experience, but also in the experience of that checker. So in who, this case, white privilege was a good thing? It was, because it was, it was a good thing because this woman used it to step into a situation understanding that she walked through the world differently and that her voice would be heard differently. I think it's horrific that that's the state of affairs that we're in, But I am a realist, and I live in America. 
And so it is not enough, and people have been talking about this. There's a professor at American U- University named Ibram Kendi who's just yeah, given uh, we'll talk great about. talks about uh, how being uh, not being a racist is not enough. Yeah. And this is a matter for all of us. And so the willingness to step in and to lend your voice, your support, when you see a situation that is not appropriate is one of the small steps that starts a cultural change. Because culturally right now in America, it is perfectly fine to be a bigot. You can say anything. We just had a government official say that the Statue of Liberty and the words on that statue were only meant for white Europeans. That's true. He said it out loud and proud. He wasn't ashamed. Well, as you of point it. out, when something's important, people write it down. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, when I see those words, I didn't see only white people written next to them. But this is the state that we are in the country. And so when people are saying these things, when people are advocating positions that are clearly connected to white supremacy, to racism, to the concept that blacks are somehow not worth what whites are worth. This is where people can stand up and step in. But in a way, isn't it better that they do feel free to say this stuff out loud? Because then you know who to talk to, right? Uh, I will say this. I grew up in the Deep South, so uh, there is a level at which what's happening today is not new. I've heard this stuff before. What's dangerous about it is that it's socially acceptable. Acceptable, yeah. Woodrow Wilson screened Birth of a Nation in the White House, one of the first movies ever screened in the White House, one of the most racist pieces of trash. Nobody could dispute that, I think. Not one black person appeared in that movie, white actors and blackface. And if anybody listening thinks that blackface is a funny Halloween costume, I'd encourage them to watch Birth of a Nation and see if they still have that feeling. That movie managed to degrade not only black people. It managed to degrade the serious issue of sexual assault against women. And when Woodrow Wilson saw that movie, he made a statement that the producer, D.W. Griffith, was so enamored with, he put it on his advertisements. And what Woodrow Wilson said is the Ku Klux Klan just arose out of white, self-instinct for self-preservation, and it is a glorious organization. That is right in the middle of when America was lynching black people at a rate of almost two a week, on average. Woodrow Wilson didn't lynch one black person. But when the President of the United States is spewing racial hatred from the White House, Why are you surprised if people start getting hurt? And that's a lesson, seemingly, that we haven't learned. Because we're living it again right now. Donald Trump hasn't shot or killed anybody. But when the President of the United States is spewing racial hatred from the White House, don't be surprised if people start getting hurt. Well, he would deny that. If he denies... He's spewing racial hatred from the White House. What I say is this. This isn't open to interpretation. Read the words he has said. They are what they are. When he calls white people who carry a swastika right next to white people who carry a Confederate flag, and you know the only and true meaning of the Confederate flag, and he calls them very nice people. If your view is that that is not an endorsement of racial hatred, then we have a disagreement. I think you said on the some definition. Of them, right? Some of them. I think you said some of them. Yes, some of them. Five people. Some of them. And and I would debate with you and anybody else in America how somebody associating themselves with the Nazi flag and the Confederate flag and what those things stand for. If to you those are nice people, then I would say 
that you very likely have views that make you a white supremacist. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Yeah. There are probably people, I'm guessing, who would come across one-on-one as perfectly nice people and then have this hobby where on weekends they turn into somebody else. And you see that and you say, well, let's see. If this guy who seems normal most of the time carries a Nazi flag around once in a while, that's just a hobby. Let's let it pass. You're saying that that's a pretty dangerous approach to take. I'm saying that's putting your head in the sand. That's a hobby. It's a hobby. They would never, it's a hobby. They would never actually act out in the way that the it actual out in Nazis the, they're, did. They're acting it out in their lives. This is exactly what people in Germany were saying in 1927 and 1930. Don't worry about the Nazis. They'll never do this stuff. They're just talking. Anybody that says that has no understanding of history. And if you're telling me as a black American that somebody who carries a symbol that says that I should be enslaved or exterminated is a nice person that I don't have to worry about, what I say to you is we have a different view of the world. Well, you're talking about the Confederate flag. They come back and they say this is just our history. And, and, And they are absolutely right. It is their history. It's the history of white supremacy. Go back and look at who created the Confederate flag. William T. Thompson. And what did he say about the flag? This flag is emblematic of our superiority over the black or inferior race. People say that the battle flag of Northern Virginia, which is what most people associate as the Confederate flag, they say, oh, well, that was different than the flag William T. Thompson created. It didn't mean the same thing. In 1662, the people of Virginia passed a law saying that the children of enslaved mothers were enslaved people. Why did they need that law? Because white Virginia men were raping the black women, and they just wanted to make it clear in case those babies came out with freckles or blue eyes, that's not a human being. That's an enslaved being. In 1667, Virginia passes a law that says enslaved people who are becoming Christian Don't worry about that. That doesn't make them human. Now, if you're a a Christian that says Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I tell you that I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, don't you have to start thinking about me kind of like a human being? But the Virginia people said, no, no, don't worry. uh, An enslaved person could only become Christian through the charity and piety of their owners. All these laws were written down. So if you want to know what the battle flag stood for, you don't have to listen to apologists today talk about what they want to make the flag stand for. Why don't you go to the people that created it and the people that lived their lives under it and the people that went into battle to maim and murder hundreds of thousands of people to protect what it represented? And when you ask those people what the flag represented, they tell you. White supremacy, period, end of story. Not something else. White supremacy. So what do the the descendants of those people who fought that war and believed in the cause, how should they look back at their family tree or their relatives people or their family name? People weren't just one thing. Whoever said that people were just one thing, and that's, again, this myth of America and the legend of America. Oh, we have to erase all the, the, the ugly spots because we were just about truth and justice and freedom. And that's not true. That doesn't mean that this isn't a great country. America has demonstrated a capacity for greatness again and again and again and again. And America is one of the most racist countries on the face of the earth. Those two things are not exclusive. So you can acknowledge that without, without believing that America is a horrible place. America is a great country. It's also the most racist country on the face of the earth. And those two things are not mutually exclusive, but they are not compatible. The most racist a, country? It is, it is as racist as any other country on the face of the earth. Name me another one. I don't know. Saudi Arabia? Name me. If you... Look at the China? history. Look at the history of. Once again, you're saying that based on the legend of American history. You yeah. don't know American history. You don't know. I don't know for Chinese ex- history. For example, <laughs> you don't know that the entire electoral college 
was put in place so the South would have major control over who became president of the United States. Remember what Patrick Henry yeah. said? 236,000 blacks in Virginia as the country's being formed. There were n- virtually no blacks in the North. You multiply 236,000 by three-fifths, you still get a really big number, especially when you consider the population of the colonies at that time. And so every black face in the South was an, almost an additional electoral college vote for the southern states. That is white supremacy, pure right. and simple. No, I get that. But I'm asking you as somebody who has studied this, you, you, you really believe that today in 2019 – you compare America to any other country on earth, we are the most racist. No, I said as racist as, as any racist. other country in the world. And I can tell you this, the federal government, not just local discrimination or people not liking each other, the federal government drew red line maps of every major city in America. I know that. And then they enforced them. And you take a look at the red line map from Seattle, Washington in 1936 and compare it to the racial dot map of Seattle, Washington in 2010. The University of Virginia took a map of the United States, they took the results of the 2010 census, and they put a dot on the map for every person identified in that census. Different colors for different races of people. You compare the 1936 red line map to the 2010 racial dot map, and you will see that Seattle is as segregated now as it was then. The Kerner Commission in 1967, just three weeks before King was killed, came out with a report. And you may be old enough to remember it. Lyndon Johnson, we had just come out of the summer of 67, and Lyndon Johnson had this report, and it said, we are headed toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal, and had all of these problems with America. The Economic Policy Institute came out with a report 50 years to the day later. 50 years to the day. Blacks have made no progress compared to whites when it comes to employment, education, and incarceration. No progress in 50 years. You tell me what that means. You tell me what it means when America's schools today are virtually as segregated as they were when Brown versus the board passed. That's not personal choice. That's racism. Black males make up about 7% of the population, and we make up about 37% of the incarcerated population. Either we're just more criminal. We're just evil. We're just more willing to break the law. I don't respect the law like you do. I'm just more willing to do evil, bad things. Or something else is going on. And when, I, when you look at the true history of America, not the legend, not the whitewash version that we teach our children, but the actual true history that is written down for anybody to look at, you will come to the same conclusion that I come to, which is we have a significant amount of work to do. Yeah. You're going to start, uh, be talking about this at Town Hall on the 21st. I hear it's sold out, so if you haven't got a ticket, it's going to be uh, tough to get in. But um, just by Googling Jeffrey Robinson, there are all manner of uh, videos and uh, speeches and material you can uh, talk about. Um, I'm just curious, has any progress been made on breaking the uh, iron grip of Texas and California on what's in textbooks? Because it seems to me a lot, you know, if you were able to accomplish that, that would that's that's the critical that is the critical issue when it, when it comes to education in America. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center did a study in 2017 where they looked at the top ten most quote unquote popular history textbooks. They looked at the state content standards for teaching history, and they interviewed a cross section of social studies teachers and high school seniors. Less than 25% of them could identify slavery as the main cause of the Civil War. Two-thirds of them didn't know that it took a constitutional amendment to end slavery. And when you say end slavery, what the 13th Amendment says is that it's preserved for people who commit crimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's literally the words of the 13th Amendment. And less than 
twenty percent of them could identify provisions in the Constitution that gave advantages to slaveholders. One of the things that George Orwell wrote in his book, 1984, is who controls the past controls the future. And if you just wipe all of this stuff away, I understand why many white Americans are saying Civil War ended 154 years ago. Why are you still complaining about it? I understand that because based on the history that we've been taught, that's a perfectly legitimate question. And that's why the opponents of H.R. 40 are so desperate to stop a commission because if a national commission starts digging into the documents that make up our rich history, they will find the good, the bad, and the ugly. Why doesn't the ACLU write a textbook? Uh, The ACLU is doing all kinds of work. I'm at the ACLU. I'm doing this work. Other people at the ACLU are publicizing this history. Our documentary, we hope, will be part of that discussion. But I think that that's one of the things that H.R. 40 can do. But people forget about the Japanese-American reparations for World War II. It took 10 years before Congress agreed that we were going to pay that money out. And in that 10-year period, they did exactly what H.R. 40 looks to do. They established a commission, and they put liberals and conservatives on the commission, Mm -hmm. people from the Japanese-American community and people from the military. And they all went into the history. They're all looking at the same documents. So if we are looking at the Texas secession statement saying that the enslavement of black people is justified by the will of the almighty creator, we are not then going to write in a history book, slavery was a side issue to the Civil War, regardless of what our political affiliation is. And that's what I think people are afraid of, is that that commission brought together people from across political lines to look at a problem and just go, oh, shit, (laughs) pardon me, this is really bad, and we ought to do something about it. And isn't that that like the hallmark of greatness for any individual or for any country? People talk about loving America. I love America enough to criticize it. What parent would go to their child who has done something really horrible and say, not going to criticize you about that. Don't worry about it because I love you you so much. Every American conservative and liberal would reject that approach to a problem. And yet that's what people are saying about this problem in America. Don't talk about it. It will divide us more. We're already divided in case people haven't noticed that. And we're divided because we don't have a common history. When you're asking communities to come together, they have to have some commonality. They have to have a common history that they can talk about. And we in America have a common history. But not all of that history is beautiful. Some of it is really ugly. And it's only by acknowledging that that we move forward together. Acknowledging that history up until today will have an impact on what we do going forward. Who controls the past controls the future. And I would like the past that guides our future to be the complete story and the real story, not just the legend. Well, Germany did it, right? It it, it is remarkable. It is difficult for you to go to Germany, to any major city, without understanding that something really bad happened there in the 30s and 40s. You can't go anywhere without the reminder being thrown in your face. And some people would say, like, okay, enough. But I think think that's wrong. I think it's the concept that this is what we did. So we need something similar here, then. We need need some kind kind of of reconciliation, a reckoning. That word, a reckoning, is... Is, is a really appropriate word, and we have always evaded that reckoning. It's one of the things that Brian Stevenson with the Equal Justice Initiative and the memorials to the victims of lynchings. People talk about all of these Southern Confederate monuments, and, and actually if you go on YouTube, there's a presentation that I've given about that, telling simply the simple truth behind the monuments and who they celebrate when they were built, and, and people can judge for themselves. But wouldn't it be interesting, in Charleston, South Carolina, there is a monument to John C. Calhoun, 
congressperson from South Carolina, governor of South Carolina, senator from South Carolina, vice president of the United States. John Kennedy said he was one of the greatest politicians in American history. and He was also a virulent racist. The statements he made about slavery and how excellent it was and how he would never apologize for it because white people were superior uh, to black people. There is a monument to John C. Calhoun in Charleston, South Carolina, that you can see standing in front of Mother Emanuel Church, where Dylan Ruth killed the nine people. Mother Emanuel Church is on Calhoun Street. What would happen if you don't take that monument down, which I believe it should come down, because John C. Calhoun was a racist, and we don't build monuments to people who are white supremacists if we are not a country that celebrates white supremacy. But even if you don't take it down, how about putting up right next to it the EJI monuments that recognize every black person that was lynched in Charleston, South Carolina, in that county? The children would say, well, Mommy and Daddy, they've got this statue of this guy, and they've got this. What's a lynching? Who was John Calhoun? Well, if he said all these really horrible things about black people, why did they have a statue for him up there? Now, that would be confronting our history. But no, 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 we can't have that discussion. But that's simply the truth. And I'm not afraid of the truth. What is it that you're afraid of? Are you afraid that your view of the world is now going to be challenged because you have to acknowledge that things that you accepted as true are not? That's a hard thing for anybody. It is. Jeffrey Robinson is the director of the ACLU's Trone Center for Justice and Equality. Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Remember that when there's a longer version of the interviews on Seattle's Morning News, you can usually find it right here in the original form, unconstrained by the limitations of a live broadcast. And you can subscribe so that when someone says, did you hear what was on Seattle's Morning News, you can say, not only that, I heard the part that wasn't on Seattle's Morning News. So my advice is to subscribe, and then when we talk to an author, a politician, an entrepreneur, an artist, a scientist, a teacher, a journalist, a celebrity, you'll hear every word. I'm Dave Ross. Thanks for tuning in. 